Yeah, I think the question of whether any uh, long-standing Marxist tradition could have survived the oppression of the official communist and uh, Stalinist-influenced East Bloc control and the destruction of the environment and repression of poor and working-class people and all of the many degradations of life. I would be surprised if um, the fluid, open, and uh, creative Marxism that flourished, for example, uh, in 1968, not so much in Prague, but in the West, in the New Left, if that had found some space to grow, given how badly the word Marx, Marxism uh, or the idea of socialism has been distorted in Eastern Europe. So I'm not surprised. But now that it's clear capitalism uh, undergoes crises similar to those that were identified by Marx in Das Kapital, financial crises, under which there are deep-seated uh, problems very profoundly related to overproduction and the overaccumulation of capital, now it makes sense to come back more openly to a Marxist economic critique. The thing that Marx would have done much more to show that capitalism has profound internal contradictions is the ecological side, which is there in Marx's work in his discussion of the metabolic rift. But when you think of the rift that is opening up between our future and our present, a rift uh, especially with climate change, that threatens uh, the very uh, survival of so many species, including our own, then I think the profound critique of capitalism that Marx had in mind is absolutely vital. It's probably the only coherent uh, philosophical approach that can root the ecological uh, crisis within the crisis of capitalism. Well, yes, because I don't uh, understand the Soviet bloc to have been a socialist uh, uh, experiment genuinely with poor and working class people in control of the means of production and with the environment, gender relations and so many other uh, facets of our humanity being properly uh, cared for. I would see it more having never lived here, uh, though, as uh, a, a simple capitalist firm competing in a capitalist world economy and using through its apparatchiks all the measures of oppression that we know uh, did occur here to keep the working class and poor people and Democrats and environmentalists repressed. Uh, the points of, uh, say, Rosa Luxemburg uh, and even perhaps Lenin, perhaps Trotsky, uh, in trying to deepen democracy were repressed uh, by Stalin. But more importantly, I think what Luxembourg uh, saw when she understood imperialism was capital uh, destroying the pre-capitalist in order to make up for its own internal deficiencies. David Harvey's brought that back with the idea accumulation by dispossession, that under stress, uh, under crisis conditions, capitalism goes beyond its normal speed up of work, its super exploitative processes. Um, it goes even beyond geographical uh, fixes and financialization. It goes into the realm where capitalism meets the non-capitalist in ways that uh, in the current period are far more extreme than ever before. And that includes the potential destruction of, uh, of the world's environment with climate change at such extreme uh, threatening levels. And I think uh, the uh, Luxembourg tradition and many other dissidents within uh, Marxism who fought against Stalinism uh, would continue today to uh, demand that eco-socialism and feminist socialism and uh, a more democratic project of transcending capitalism be uh, atop our agenda because without that we won't solve any of the other problems properly. Yes, the debate that is now uh, taking on quite an important uh, scale of uh, um, yeah, com comparison of evidence would be whether the BRICS are anti-imperialist or sub-imperialist. Let me just start that again and I'll say it properly. So the, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa have been portrayed by some as uh, an anti-imperialist project in the South African capital, Pretoria, many of our uh, leading thinkers in the government, some trained in Moscow, really would argue that uh, there's a new um, poly uh, uh, 
anarchic uh, power structure that would include a new development bank, a BRICS bank with $50 billion promised, a $100 billion currency fund. And yet there's so much uh, countervailing evidence to show that the BRICS aren't anti-imperialist, but sub-imperialist. For example, if they were genuinely interested in changing world finance, wouldn't the BRICS have uh, uh, rejected the idea of giving $75 billion to the International Monetary Fund in 2012. Wouldn't they genuinely have uh, tried for a new strategy for development banking by supporting the Bank of the South, uh, that the late Hugo Chavez initiative? Uh, wouldn't they have uh, found some uh, common cause in demanding a World Bank president, uh, not from the Washington uh, consensus, unfortunately they couldn't even agree on a, a strategy, wouldn't they have found um, uh, approaches that would allow China to delink from its current dependence upon uh, U.S. consumers for which it spends vast amounts of money in uh, lending to the U.S. government for treasury bill purchases. These are the contradictions in finance. If we move to something like climate, we again see the BRICS with much higher levels of uh, total greenhouse gas emissions than even the United States, China out uh, uh, running the United States now as the number one greenhouse gas emitter. But most importantly, the deals that have been done in the COPS, the Conference of the Parties, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, are very much uh, collaborative deals between uh, the U.S. with uh, its main partners, as we saw in Copenhagen, uh, Brazil, India, China, and South Africa. And there's no attempt by these major emitters to break away from a very self-destructive course of capitalism uh, threatening uh, the world climate. There are many other examples where the BRICS are legitimating world capitalism uh, by trying to become a part of it rather than fighting it. And that, uh, to me, means uh, that those fighting against Brazilian corporations in Mozambique, Chinese corporations in Zimbabwe in the diamond fields, um, Russian corporations trying to sell nuclear energy to South Africa, uh, the, uh, the Indian corporations uh, in the continent. These are very important struggles in Africa that show uh, that there will be resistance if the BRICS uh, continue a sub-imperialist trajectory supported by South Africa. And that's why the Durban conference uh, of the BRICS included a BRICS from below uh, counter summit that the Center for Civil Society and uh, our two allies groundwork in the South Durban Community Environmental Alliance promoted as a beginning of a network that can help to make the links and ensure that these big corporations supported by the BRICS get uh, increasing resistance. Yeah, there, there are two uh, market strategies that the BRICS broadly support, um, and uh, one of them, carbon trading, is dominant. Uh, the other is a carbon tax that would increase the price uh, for polluters. South Africa has recently adopted that. Um, the carbon trading strategy, uh, which China is beginning to put into effect, uh, is most advanced in Europe with the European Union emissions trading scheme. And it really has proven uh, since its beginning and the peak of its power in 2008 when a ton of carbon was about 35 euros, uh, now it's down to about 4 euros. And uh, as a result of this experience of crashing prices of over allocation of fraud and corruption throughout the European market here, even in Prague in 2011, fraud in, in the form of computer hacking and stealing of certified emissions reductions credits even closed the market for two weeks. And these uh, experiences are, uh, I think, enough to suggest we need a different strategy, not reliant upon financial markets. Financial markets are absolutely um, uh, chaotic at the moment, uh, impossible to regulate, able to run money and run scams far beyond the, the possibilities of the public or even ordinary capitalists getting them under control. So we need to have a much different approach. And I must add that uh, the carbon tax uh, would only change at the margin uh, the decisions of corporations. And so again, as a market-based strategy, we would probably want to see something much 
different. Um, market strategies don't have the capacity to really reform uh, at the level required. New agricultural systems not so reliant on uh, pesticides and fertilizer where the local markets are, are the uh, project or transport that's public or um, energy systems that are renewable or production systems that are uh, green and, and uh, consumption that is more normal, not hedonistic, and disposal systems that are oriented to zero waste. These cannot really be done within capitalism. There's no market system that can be massaged to get to the changes that we really do require to survive. Yeah, the Africa Rising theme came up uh, in 2011, and it was a revival of a standard narrative that if export-led growth and extraction of minerals and petroleum and cash crops um, pursues uh, with multinational corporations, foreign direct investment uh, being open without exchange controls and uh, trade restrictions, then Africa will prosper. And this is a long-standing argument that goes back to really Berlin in 1884-85. That was the essence of dividing Africa uh, by country so that the colonial powers could take the plantations and the mines and strip out the goods and build the roads, the railroads, the bridges, the ports to get Africa's um, useful commodities out of the continent. Nothing has changed and the Africa rising uh, narrative ignores the reality that once you incorporate the extractive processes and count how much uh, non-renewable resource depletion occurs, Africa is not rising, Africa is crashing. The net adjusted savings, according to the World Bank, is not positive 6% per year, the gross domestic product increase in some places, but negative 6% per year once you incorporate the uh, outflow of non-renewable resources. In other words, Africa is being looted. And in some countries, Canada, Australia, Norway, for example, the looting occurs such that the reinvestment of the capital allows the society to become wealthier. In Africa's case, the corporations that are looting are essentially external, and that means the profits and the revenues from selling are all externalized. And there are very few efforts to make profound changes to uh, the systems, for example, of international finance and trade that would prevent that. And therefore, we're seeing a huge increase in protests, many around extraction, protests against land grabs, protests against uh, mineral extraction, workers protesting they aren't being paid enough, such as at the Maracana Lawnmin mine that led to a massacre in 2012. These are the kinds of protests that mean if you measure, including North Africa, where democracy protests were partly about control of resources, if you measure the number of protests, you can definitely say Africa's rising. It's a huge increase. If you measure Africa's GDP properly by correcting GDP and saying uh, net depletion of resources means we actually are seeing Africa crashing in economic terms, then we're getting closer to reality. Well, I think the point of uh, doing scholar activism, uh, if we can say this is what we promote at the Center for Civil Society, is that sometimes, a lot of times, better knowledge is produced. And the reason is that we study systems, and the systems typically will reproduce, and you find a pattern. But sometimes under stress, those systems react in ways that teach us. And the stress is often from below, from those who resist the system. And the system might be patriarchy, and you might have feminists, or it might be racism, and anti-racists are challenging, or capitalists challenged by workers or uh, community members unhappy with the profit motive. It's when those systems are stressed from below, and when you find resistance creating lots of friction, and therefore heat, but also light. And in the light, when you see a system under stress, you'll find out whether the system crushes or co-opts or maybe even makes a concession to those challenging it. And when you find out by being close as an activist or a scholar activist to being able to ask the activists what is happening with integrity, with critical capacities, so that this isn't simply hackish uh, promotional work, but critical work, then you learn a lot more than an armchair academic will, never close to the source of the friction and the heat, often too scared to be close to a source of 
big questions raised by activists. So profound respect is what we have um, in our scholarly community for the knowledge that's produced by activists. Secondly, let me just say, um, in Durban, South Africa, the city with the highest number of HIV positive people uh, in the world, uh, 600,000 or more uh, out of three and a half million. And with the struggle beginning to get medicines uh, for AIDS that would at least keep the uh, people from dying, HIV positive people require antiretroviral medicines if they're uh, body count, CD4 count, goes below 350. And that means we need at least for one and a half or two million people uh, free medicines. And the medicines 10 years ago cost $15,000. Uh, and it was impossible for me to stand here saying this struggle to get medicines to save the lives of millions, South Africa had 5 million HIV positive people, this struggle will be successful. But today we can say it was, and the people that normally would have paid $15,000 and therefore not been able to afford the medicines now get them for free. The life expectancy in South Africa has gone from 52 years uh, to 60 on average in the last eight years. These uh, results, along with the defeat of apartheid itself, mean that activists who are struggling for justice sometimes win. And when they win, for example, against the intellectual property of big pharmaceutical companies, they can also teach us about future trajectories of people in struggle, strategies that work, tactics that work, analyses that are sufficiently large, and alliances that are sufficiently wide that a major enemy, big pharmaceutical companies, trade-related intellectual property system within the World Trade Organization, big governments like Washington and Pretoria can be defeated even by um, a small group of activists. Probably a thousand activists persevered and were able to defeat these huge uh, forces against them. And these, along with the defeat of apartheid, taught me that it is possible to be audacious in your critical analysis without being pessimistic. Pessimism of the intellect, but uh, an optimism of the will, as Gramsci implored us. And I think that's the spirit we need in an era in which financialization, ecological destruction, and the overaccumulation of capital, the uneven and combined development of capitalism, uh, is so far out of control. We need a, a fight back that encompasses all of its victims and a fight back that can name what we need as a future eco socialism. <laughs>